How many people in here grow in organic? It's going to be a tough crowd. I got one, right? Uh, no, I, I think this is great because, you know, in organic, uh, we think about ways to build soil organic matter, build biodiversity, use cover crops effectively. Sound familiar? Yeah. Right? So so we're, we're all trying to do the same thing. I don't think anybody's going to argue whether you're in an organic system or a commodity system that uh, building your soil, making it more productive, making it more healthy so that you can ultimately get better yields and, and uh, make it economically viable, that's not a, ever a bad thing, right? So, uh, so I'm glad to be here, um, and we're going to get into a little bit about soil microbiology. I, I like to think of it as the livestock under your feet. Um, I've kind of stole that from a farmer that I work with down in Kentucky. He's got a 550-acre organic operation, uh, and he runs a pretty interesting system. He's got an eight-year rotation. It's an integrated rotation where he's got five years of grass-fed, pastured, certified organic uh, livestock, cows and sheep, and he runs uh, pastured poultry off this land and pastured turkeys. I guess that's poultry, but turkeys. Um, he gets about 160 bucks a turkey right at Thanksgiving time, certified organic turkey. He's doing pretty pretty good with that, right? Um, um, you know, so he's got five years of this pasture system, and then he runs three years of um, certified organic vegetables that he uh, markets at farmer's markets in Lexington, Louisville, and Cincinnati, as well as a 400-person CSA. So he's making a pretty good income off his livestock in the field and his crops, but he'll be the first to tell you that he can't do it if he doesn't have the quality of product. And he thinks that the quality of the product is coming from the way he's managing his soils. Those pastures are building up the livestock under the ground, the microbiology. Uh, and I've been thinking about this for a long time. Uh, and so we're, we're going to get into a little bit of it. But before I do, I hope someone can take a picture of me up here um, to let my mom know I was in church this week. Uh, she'll, she'll, she'll see the cross behind me and think I got a promotion, you know. But, uh, but um, right, right, right. <laughs> Let's see, which way do I point this thing to make a move? There we go. I think I skipped one. So, so just a quick overview of, of what we're talking about with this microbiology. Who's under? Who's under? Who's down there? Who's underneath our feet? Well, bacteria. You guys are probably all familiar with this. These are small, single-celled organisms. Uh, we call them prokaryotes. If you want to throw around some scientific jargon, that just means they don't have any membrane-bound organs inside. Um, they're pretty simple organisms, and they pretty much exist to basically digest whatever is hanging out around them in the environment. So, in this picture here you've got um, different types of bacteria hanging out on a sand particle uh, in a soil. Fungi. Fungi are under there too. These are basically filamentous multicellular organisms. Pretty important in building soil structure and we're going to get into that a little bit uh, in, the, in the process of this, uh, this talk. Um, decomposition, they're really important in decomposition. Can everybody hear me all right? Yeah? Yeah? Okay. Um, if you look here, this is a decom decomposer fungi. He's actually rotting a log, but this white filamentous stuff kind of looks like plant roots, but that's actually fungal hyphae. So it's, imagine this network moving through the soil, holding your soil particles together, building structure. This guy over here, this is a pretty special type of fungi. That's a mycorrhiza. Uh, these really fine hairs actually live within and on the root. Uh, and they're pretty important in helping plants get water from really fine pore spaces in the soil. Also get some phosphorus out of the soil. You know, often when we think about fungi, we think about these things, right? Mushrooms, that's what we, people think about fungi, and that's what you see on a grocery store shelf. That's really just the reproductive organ of, of a fungus. So uh, what, what we really want to think about are these things that are, as, as producers, agricultural producers and scientists, we really want to think about, unless your specialty is growing mushrooms, uh, 
are these guys here, these filamentous networks. Now these are kind of confused bacteria, actinomyces. They have a little bit of a, a personality complex. They're actually classified as bacteria, but they act like fungi. And they build these uh, filamentous networks and they behave a lot like fungi in the soil, do a lot of important decomposition processes. They're also a good source of a lot of our antibiotics. Streptomycin comes from actinomyces along with the numerous other antibiotics. So that's a pretty important uh, product that we get from some of these organisms. Nematodes, I'm not going to mention them more than just this slide, let you know they're there. These are really probably not even considered microorganisms. They're really just uh, small, non-segmented roundworms that are just on the edge of your eyesight. Uh, you need a magnifying glass or a microscope to really see them well. Some of them, you know, and, and, and I should point out that with all these groups of organisms, whether it's bacteria, fungi, uh, actinos, well, not so much actinos, but nematodes, there are a lot that we, when we think about these critters, what do we think about? If you hear fungus on your crops, what are you thinking about most of the time? Some kind of darn disease that's going to take your, your yields down, right? But that's just really a small percentage of the overall population of microorganisms that are in the soil. There are by far a vast, vastly higher amount of either neutral or beneficial in some way organisms. So and we don't think about those too much. We just think about the ones that cause us trouble. And that's rightfully so, right? We want to figure out ways to control those and keep them from reducing our yields. Uh, but but it, I like to point out that there are a lot more good guys or guys that just don't care out there than there are uh, these pathogenic ones. So, so now you kind of know what's there. Let's just take a look at uh, just sort of numbers. It's been said that there is more microbial life, more microorganisms in a tablespoon of soil uh, than there are humans on the planet. And that's probably an underestimate because there are probably a whole lot more microorganisms in that, in that soil than there are people on the planet. We're at what, 7.5 billion now? There's a lot more microbes in that little tablespoon of soil. Um, 150,000 different bacterial species in a tablespoon. That's not individual bacteria, that's different species. And within each species, there are millions and millions of individuals, right? 522,000 actinomycete cells per tablespoon. 15 different types of mycorrhizal species per tablespoon. And I couldn't find a good tablespoon number for, for fungi, but, uh, you know, there's about 400 different species of fungi in a typical forest soil. It might be a little bit lower in an agricultural system since uh, by nature we have to disturb our agroecosystems agro and, and fungi tend to be impacted by that disturbance. Probably you all have probably seen this, right? This picture before, some of you. The soil microbial food web. Um, it's important to remember that what we're dealing with here is an ecosystem. You know, we're managing these livestock under our feet. We're really managing uh, the ecosystem that's down there. Uh, part of that is it starts with the sun providing the energy to the plants. Those plants grow and die, particularly, you know, if we're thinking about cover crops, mulching in a cover crop or spraying down a cover crop, however you terminate your cover crop, that cover crop's going to decompose. When it decomposes, who's at the heart of that decomposition process? Well, your microorganisms. Uh, and those microorganisms, particularly bacteria and fungi, uh, break down that material. You need some of these arthropods in there to shred it up into finer pieces. Uh, and then once these guys work on it, these guys can really get in there and turn it into organic matter. And of course, this is a food chain. So, you know, these bacteria, fungi, smaller nematodes, they feed bigger nematodes, protozoa, arthropods. And then they feed even bigger arthropods and bigger nematodes. And eventually you get up to birds birds and mammals and somewhere up the chain probably are people too, right? So this is, you know, we're thinking about soil. It's a pretty diverse habitat. All kinds of really interesting pockets where organisms can live or try to live. And it's a pretty harsh environment. Right? It's really dictated by extremes. So you think about the situation where you just terminated a cover crop. There's lots of organic material there, right? You've got a lot of happy microorganisms chewing up that organic material. Now you think about it at the 
end of summer, right, and your, your cover crop is all decomposed for the most part, maybe a little bit of mulch left there if you've got a good mulch on there, but uh, now these microorganisms are thinking about where am I going to get my food? They're really, or they're going into dormant stages, so they're hanging out until the food's more readily available. Moisture, you know, moisture can really affect how these organisms, you guys probably understand that all too well, you know, wet, dry cycles in the growing season, well, the microbes deal with that too. Um, and we've got anaerobic or aerobic situations, so different pockets within that soil will have different uh, levels of moisture. And so when you put that all together, you know, you get this really interesting habitat that accommodates microorganisms, but then larger organisms like worms and moles and voles, and ultimately, you know, the plants that we want to grow on it. So what are these microbes doing? Well, they govern a lot of processes. They decomp decompose plant residues, particularly you know, your cover crops, your organic materials, manure, compost, if you're using those types of inputs. Uh, biological nitrogen fixation, we're all familiar with that, and running, running uh, soybean through your rotation, you're getting some good nitrogen there, or if you're using uh, vetch in your cover crops, uh, or if you're using other leguminous cover crops, so that's biological nitrogen fixation. And there are some freestanding organisms that do that as well. They don't necessarily have to be uh, associated with a legume, but the legumes probably do the bulk of the fixation in an agroecological agro system. Uh, Nutrients. So these guys break down this organic matter and they release nutrients. Phosphorus, magnesium, zinc, iron, copper, uh, all these are organic sources of potential nutrients that can be released from organic material by microorganisms. Um, you know, working in organics, I think about this stuff quite a bit, biological control. A lot of organic producers talk about how they like to keep a good biodiverse ecosystem so that they can have a lot of different types of organisms in there and some of those organisms are probably competing for space within the soil against potentially pathogenic organisms. So they're maybe prohibiting, pre preventing some diseases from, from really infecting your plant as effectively as they could. Uh, Dr. Zia this morning, she talked a little bit about plant growth promotion. So there are organisms uh, that hang out right around the roots of your plants that release different hormones or other signaling compounds. Uh, and they actually interact with the plant via these signaling compounds and enhance the you know, nutrient uptake in the plants, drought tolerance in plants. And so more and more things that soil microbiologists are thinking about, like Dr. Zia was talking about this morning, is how can we start taking advantage of these types of interactions to promote healthier crops? And of course, soil structure. You know, we've all, we're, we're sitting here in soil health, so we've had a lot of uh, conversation this morning, and there'll be more this afternoon, I'm sure, about soil organic matter and managing your soil organic matter. And if you manage your soil organic matter, you build good structure. Uh, the evidence of that is a good aggregated soil. You know, these microbes release polysaccharides. They're basically complex sugars, and and the fungi uh, release these uh, grow these hyphal networks. The sugars they kind of act like a glue and glue your soil particles together, and you can think of those fungi as a net that binds all those soil particles together, and that's where you get this good soil structure. And then when you have good soil structure, you've got good water holding capacity, you've got good air movement, so you got happy root systems, right? So these organisms, these microbes, are really important for ecosystem services. What's ecosystem service? Well, that's a fancy word that scientists use to mean the good stuff that we're getting out of the soil. How is it benefiting us as, as producers? Um, how how is, is taking care of this, this ecosystem benefiting us? You know, are we producing crops? Are we filtering our water? What ecosystem services do we get from a soil? Let's start over here. I talked a little bit about structure. Well, there's a well-structured soil. And it doesn't show up as well as I'd like in this slide, but really, believe me, there's pores in there, little pore spaces in there. That's going to hold air, moisture. Uh, you can see the earthworm moving through some of that, so you got some earthworm channels there. But that's a really well-structured, probably a good organic matter content soil. That's going to hold air, that's going to hold water, and your roots are going to be happy there. And it's a habitat, not just for soil microbes and plants, but we got to think about the arthropods and the earthworms. Without soil, 
we don't have a whole lot of decomposition. So imagine the mess that we would have if we didn't have decomposition and all this stuff just built up. Actually, we probably wouldn't be here, would we, if we didn't have decomposition because we wouldn't have nutrient cycling. Uh, and then if we didn't have nutrient cycling, we wouldn't have plants growing. Uh, and we also get water purification out of some of the mineral components in the organic matter in the soil. That organic matter binds different pollutants and keeps it from moving into uh, to waterways. And that's good for us because eventually somewhere downstream someone's drinking that water, right? And we hear a lot about that these days, keeping our water clean so that we can, uh, you know, Nutrient management is, is becoming a bigger and bigger topic wherever you go. So, you know, a well-managed soil can go a long way to nutrient management. You know, we heard a lot about omics this morning, proteomics and metabolomics. And I like to think about, you know, the things that producers want to know about economics, right? How, how, much, how much is the value? And, I, and I'm going to fully admit that I stole this slide, this table from Dr. Islam uh, and Jim Horman, who are here at OSU, uh, and I appreciate them letting me borrow it. But this is the value of soil organic matter in one ton of soil. And just broken down on nutrients. So this is a soil that 1% organic matter in one ton. So for every percent of organic matter, these numbers are going to go up. So for nitrogen, you have roughly $500 in a ton of soil. Phosphorus, 70 bucks. Potassium, 40. Sulfur, 50 bucks. Carbon, people are starting to increasingly put a price tag on carbon, about 20 bucks uh, worth of carbon in a ton of soil. You add it all up. It's about 680 bucks, right? That's in a 1% organic matter soil. So if you're increasing your organic matter, you're doing a couple things. Now, how are these nutrients, again, this is coming from the organic matter in the soil, how are these nutrients getting released? Someone shout it out. <laughs> microorganisms are doing it, right? You need the microorganisms to release these, these nutrients from the organic matter. So if you're managing your soil organic matter, your soil to build organic matter, this numbers, these numbers are going to go up. If you're improving your microbial activity, that's also going to affect the release rates, and that could affect these numbers too. So you could potentially see even more benefits. And so this is what I'm going to talk about now came from some work I did as a PhD student at University of Kentucky. Um, and I, and I, I kept coming back to you know, all this stuff about soil microorganisms and I said, well, can we manage this? And I'm not the only person to think about this. Lots of people have thought about it. Can we start managing this to, to get these microbes to do what we want them to do in the soil? Can we intentionally influence them to come out with a good agronomic outcome? And so the one thing I wanted to think about was soil structure. It was kind of, we already know that fungi are kind of important in holding this structure together, but can we start tailoring management practices towards influencing that type of microbial community, fungal dominated, uh, that would promote soil structure? How would I do that? How would I do that? Well, we know there are a bunch of different factors that, that affect microbial activity. Temperature, you know, warmer, there's more microbial activity. They're going to break down organic substances faster. Moisture, they need an ideal moisture content so they can, uh, again, break down substrates. Aeration, if, you know, this is why when we plow a soil, you get that real big burst of carbon dioxide coming out of the soil because you're introducing a bunch of oxygen and those microorganisms are saying, oh wow, I can, I can breathe better so I can eat faster. Uh, and they're releasing that carbon dioxide. pH, that's something that can affect microbes. Um, but these top four, anybody figured out how to control the weather yet? No, right? So we can't really control them, right? pH, we could control that, but it comes and goes, right? We have to, we have to get back. We have to work on that every year or so, every couple years. But the one thing we can really start to think about is the way we're managing soil to put different substrates in it. And specifically, I'm thinking of things like different types of organic materials to amend our soils with. So when I was at Kentucky, I, I got the bright idea that maybe I'd... I'd play with different amendments and add them to soil and see how they affected the soil microbial community. And I thought these would have different effects because uh, the carbon content 
of these amendments is inherently different. You think about compost. Compost has already been broken down once. Microorganisms have basically chewed up and spat out all the easily chew up and spit outable stuff in that material, right? So you have this already digested organic material. Nobody wants to eat the same plate twice, right? So it's harder to break compost down. Now manure, it's been through the digestive tract of a ruminant. Uh, this big blue slice represents the stuff that's harder to break down. Humic and lignic, lignified materials, this stuff is harder to break down. So you can see there's an awful lot of it in compost, a little bit less in manure. If you look at vetch, Vetch is uh, the cover crop I looked at. Um, it has even less of this humic material. And these other three slices are relatively easily accessible to microorganisms. So let's see what happened when I added these things to soil um, with the particular goal of trying to build soil structure. So what I did in this experiment, I had three soils. These are three Kentucky soils, um, a Maury silt loam, uh, a salvisa clay loam, uh, silty clay loam rather, um, and then a, uh, oh, what was the last one? It's escaping me. I had a sandy loam in there too. I can't remember the series. My NRCS people were going to get mad at me. Um, but what I did with these soils is I, uh, I totally destroyed the native structure. And I took these soils and I ground them up and ran them through a sieve until there was no native aggregation left. And then I amended them with compost or vetch or manure, and I incubated them in a lab setting for about 80 days, 82 days. And then at the end of it, I measured aggregate formation in each treatment. And I also examined, and so to, to measure aggregation, you know, to measure, measure um, structure, I measured water stable aggregates. And that's a pretty well accepted measure of soil structure. I was looking particularly at, at aggregates that were bigger than two millimeters. Uh, and I also examined some microbial uh, measurements. So I looked at signature fatty acids, um, phospholipid fatty acids. I was actually using a fatty acid methyl ester method. But what these basically are, all organisms have this cell membrane. And within the cell membrane, there's different fatty acids that we know come from specific types of organisms. Some come from bacteria, some come from fungi, some come from actinomycetes, some come from mycorrhiza. So we can start making judgments on what's happening in the soil based on how these different fatty acids fluctuate. And the problem with it is it's not high resolution, you can't really get down to a specific type of bacteria, but it can give you some good information on how the overall community dynamics are behaving. Uh, ergosterol is a, is a compound that is found in uh, fungal membranes. It's very similar to cholesterol, but we know that ergosterol only comes from fungi, so it was also an interesting bioindicator to look at. So after I incubated these soils, 82 days, um, I pulled them out of the incubator, I did wet sieving on them and measured these um, aggregates and formation of aggregates. How stable was this soil um, after 82 days of incubation? And if you look on this, it may be a little bit hard to see, but the purple line represents the hairy veg treatment. In all three soils, that hairy veg treatment produced the greatest amount of macroaggregates. So we went from a soil that had no structure to a soil that had a pretty high degree of biologically mediated soil aggregation. And we know that the microbes were one of the dominant forces in, in pulling these, these aggregates together. Manure did all right. It did a little, little it did in between um, vetch and the other treatments. Compost, it induced some aggregate formation in the in the silty clay loam. It didn't do much at all, and I'm not sure why this happened the way it did, but I'm still kind of thinking about answers for that. Uh, but the compost is a little bit less than the manure, and then the control, there's a little bit of organic matter in this stuff inherently, and so that's going to produce some microbial activity, and that's going to help bind just a little bit of macroaggregates macro together. So basically, you know, to sum up, Vetch did a great job at promoting soil structure. Manure, pretty good. And the compost and the control were both down sort of at the bottom there. 
All right, now these are getting into some stuff here, um, but these are the microorganisms. This is the fatty acids, the signature fatty acids, right? So just focus on these in these little collective columns. So this is a Mori silt loam, a salvisa, um, silty clay loam, and the Jaeger is actually the name of the sandy soil that I was using. Uh, and you can see in all three soils, this is fungal fatty acids. The vetch produced the most fungal fatty acids consistently, except for in the sandy soil, and I'm not really sure what's going on there. Um, but for some reason, the manure seemed to produce a lot of um, fungal fatty acids in the sandy soil. Bacterial, soil or bacterial fatty acids, all the treatments increased the number of bacteria relative to the control. So the control was this red line that had no amendment at all. So your organic amendments are all adding uh, bacterial activity to that soil, enhancing bacterial activity in that soil. This total fatty acids, scientists use that as a measure of overall microbial biomass, the whole, the, the, the sum total of all the microorganisms in your soil. And you can see across the board that all of the treatments uh, enhanced the, micro, the, the total microbial biomass in the soil. But then I want to hone in on fungus in particular. If we go back, we can see, yeah, we got, we got a lot of fungal increase with manure and vetch and all the soils. It looks a little different in the sandy soil, but, but I think we can all agree that there's a, this, this purple is a little bigger than these blue and red, right? That's the vetch um, increasing the fungal activity. But when we look at it on a proportional basis, looking at fungal fatty acids as a ratio with bacterial fatty acids, we can start to really see that uh, at least in the, in the two siltier, the, the heavier soils, the silt loam and the silty clay loam, you're really starting to increase fungi relative to bacteria. What I'm trying to say here is that the fungi are increasing more in proportion uh, compared to bacteria. And then over here, this ergosterol, this just basically agrees with all of the other measurements on the previous slide. We're showing again, vetch really seems to increase that fungal content in the soil. Uh, manure, relatively all right, but it's, it's a clear cut case with the vetch. With the manure, it's not as clear with this, this particular indicator. All right, what's going on here? Well, this slide, this picture is basically showing us all these little diamonds here, these are all microbial communities that were influenced by hairy vetch, okay? The squares are all microbial communities. And, I, and what I did by when I say microbial communities, I, I examined all of these different microbial signature uh, fatty acids, I ran them through a statistical program and it kind of plotted these based on their similarity. Um, and so all of the vetch influenced communities kind of all fell towards this end of the graph on the right. Over here you've got your compost and your control communities. The manure kind of all fell down here at the bottom side of the graph, uh, bottom right corner basically. But, but what this is telling you is that all of these arrows, they represent some component that I was measuring in the soil or in the plants. Um, so water-soluble carbon, acid-soluble carbon, um, and non-polar carbon. If you, if you go back to this picture, that's the purple, light purple, and tan, right? Macroaggregates, formation of macroaggregates, fungal fatty acids, ergosterol, all of these lines indicate a relationship. The strongest relationships are with the communities, the microbial communities that were influenced by hairy vetch. And you see similar, similar, you know, it's, it's somewhat drawn to these manure influenced communities too, but they're clearly going the opposite direction from these other communities, right? But a picture's worth a thousand words or a silly diagram like that, right? This is, this is an actual picture of what I pulled out of the incubator, all right? If you look at column A here, column A was my control soil. 
Column B was my compost amended soil. Column C was my vetch amended soil. And column D was my manure amended soil. What do you notice about column C? It's a different color. What you're seeing there is actually a mat. And it doesn't show up. I really should have taken a picture of this at the night. I was just a graduate student, didn't know what I was doing then. So I didn't get down there and take a really nice magnified picture. But if you look real close at that, what you see is this fuzz on top of the soil. And it's actually fungal hyphae coming up out of that soil. And it created this fungal mat right on top of the soil. So you can actually visually see in this picture what all this data before was was telling you so so if the, all the data just was a bunch of mumbo jumbo here it is vetch produced a whole lot of fungi and when i ran that soil through a sieve it didn't break down as badly all right so essentially what that's telling me is that if you're promoting fungi in a soil, you're going to potentially enhance your soil structure. And we all we kind of knew that, but now we're actually tying it to different management practices that can influence development, promote development of a fungal community, and in turn promote aggregate formation. And, and again, I think that basically the amendment carbon characteristics were really driving the different effects that I saw. Uh, vetch, again, promoted the greatest fungal biomass, and you got the most aggregate formation there. Uh, manure did decently in both counts, uh, so it's a little bit less than less fungal biomass than vetch, and a little bit less um, macroaggregate formation. But what this tells me is we could potentially be able to start thinking about ways to, to strategically manage soil microorganisms. Yeah, we don't think about that stuff. It's probably more, you know, we probably are better off thinking about ways to strategically manage our crops and you got enough to think about designing crop rotations and timing and all that stuff. But this is just one other aspect that we can think about that we might not think about on a daily basis, right? Now, can we take this further? Can we start looking at this in terms of plant health? Um, I don't want to delve too much into this, but I, after I did that experiment with the aggregates, I looked at some plant genetics, uh, played with some, some tomatoes and, and looked at their gene expression. Uh, and, and these are actually defense response genes. This is chitinase, osmotin, and uh, beta-glucanase. These are all genes that code for proteins that are used by the plant to inhibit infection by fungi, okay? So these specifically code for enzymes that help protect the plant against fungal infection. You can see a very similar pattern in gene expression on these. Uh, and what you're looking at here in the bottom is actually different management treatment. And so very similar to what I did with the aggregation, except I added a couple of different twists. Um, so we've got a control, we've got compost amendment, we've got manure amendment. Uh, this NIT is inorganic nitrogen, so that was uh, ammonium nitrate. ORG is organic management, that's soil that had been organically managed for about eight years. Uh, and then vetch is hairy vetch. And I will point out that this organic management had a lot of cover crops on it, but it also had uh, periodic manure applications. So you could see these defense genes all kind of express themselves in a similar way. And we wanted to think about is this related to microorganisms in the soil? So we did a few different analysis on it. Uh, and, and again, I got back to these signature fatty acids. And again, I said one of the problems with the fatty acids is they don't give you the resolution that you really want. You can't pinpoint a specific organism and say, oh, that, that, that effect is coming from uh, Aromonas. You can't do that. But, uh, but you can get down to specific groups. And I was able to take it down to the uh, gram-negative bacterial level. And we started to see a negative correlation with gram-negative bacteria. So this, this 18, 1, omega-7, that just is an indicator for um, gram-negative bacteria. And then there, there are several different gram-negative bacterial indicators, and you can add them up and sum them. And when I did that, I was able to get some correlations. So this is osmotin. Again, it's a defense gene. 
the higher amount of, of gram-negative bacteria you had in the soil, the less osmotin was being expressed in tomato plants. This PR1B is a uh, pathogenic resistance protein. And again, same trend, right? The more gram-negative bacteria, the, the lower the, ex the expression of this gene. And now, I don't really have the data to, to prove this, but we thought about this for a while, and this was the experiment was what, what some scientists would call a little bit of a fishing expedition, uh, trying to see what effects we could see when you, when you, when you impose them on a soil. But, but you know, we know that some manures actually suppress other organisms, and I think Dr. Zia talked about that a little bit this morning. She was talking about suppressive soils. You know, and we thought maybe, and again, we didn't collect the data. This is just our sort of, here's what we got with this experiment. Where are we going to take it next kind of idea. Um, you know, maybe some of these, uh, some of the manures suppressing other organisms, and some of those other organisms might be potentially harmful or pathogenic to the plant. And if you're suppressing those organisms, maybe the plant doesn't have to spend as much resources on defense, expressing defense genes, and it, instead it can focus on being a happy, healthy plant and hopefully send more energy to grains or vegetables or wherever you want to send it, right? So my take home messages from this, you know, is, is I want to encourage us all to think about the stuff that we don't necessarily always think about, right? The livestock under your feet, you know, it's under there. It's under there. We know it's under there, but we're walking on it most of the time and it's not, it's kind of out of sight, out of mind. But, you know, as producers and research scientists, we can start thinking about ways to uh, manage this stuff, hopefully to make more productive uh, systems. And, you know, we can potentially do this. I, you know, I showed it with soil structure. Didn't show it as well with the gene expression experiment, but, but there's a little bit of evidence there that leads me to think that there might be something there. Um, you know, and I think the ultimate take-home message of all of it is, you know, if you're enhancing your biodiversity and you're increasing your soil organic matter, that's never going to be a bad thing. Whether you're an organic producer or commodities producer, it gets back to what I was talking about at the beginning. If you're uh, cutting down on fertilizer costs because you've got better nutrient cycling, that's a good thing, right? I'd like to just acknowledge UK. I did most of this research at UK, and Southern Sayre partially funded this research. Uh, and I should also acknowledge Richard Dick at Ohio State University. Uh, I learned the uh, fatty acid method in his lab when I was here for two years before I bailed out to get married. <laughs> <laughs>